that ability to plan, I think, is really important. And what does that mean from the point of view of the nature of the generative model? Well, it simply means that to plan is to have a prediction of the consequences of action in the future. And simply saying in the future immediately says, you've got the kind of generative model that is freed from the moment. So this is like uh, Jerry Edelman's remembered present. So you've got a generative model now that acquires a temporal depth. It has a horizon in the future, which is quite remarkable. Thermostat doesn't have that, a virus won't have that. You could even argue that small insects don't have that. But things that plan, things that choose to do this or that, must at some level, or at least can be described as if they had a generative model that acquires a temporal depth. And I think in that sense, as soon as you're choosing between one plan and another plan, you are truly an agent and you have a, a, you know, sort of a biological autonomy, which many things don't have. Um, and that um, that brings w uh, with it an interesting question, which um, brings us back to this notion of um, how do you choose the best plans if the imperative is to minimize surprise? Well, the best plan would be that which minimizes the surprise expected if you pursue that plan. And again, we come back. What does that mean? It means I'm going to resolve uncertainty, which simply means that anything that can plan that exists must look at some level as if it is curious. It will want to go and um, technically maximize its expected information game, which is the important part of this expected free energy or expected surprisal. Um, so um, what you're saying now is that there may be another bright line between things that move um, that are not curious and things that move that are curious. And I would say that to be a true agent, you have to have that curiosity. You have to um, so move in a way that resolves uncertainty about the state of affairs out there on the basis of your actively sampled sensations. Carl Friston genuinely needs no introduction. If you've spent any time around this channel or are interested in neuroscience and the mind, you probably already know who he is. He is one of the world's most eminent and impactful neuroscientists, having made countless contributions to neuroscience, brain imaging, and more. Here, we flush out the free energy principle and the development of the active inference framework and look at a couple of related applications. So we talk about cognition, uh, the 4E approaches, particularly in activism and affordances, the idea of affordances, uh, we talk a bit about consciousness and metacognition and, and more. If you like these conversations and would like them to continue, please consider subscribing to the channel. That really, really helps us out. Here is my conversation with Carl Frist. Uh, could you tell us about the history of predictive processing before the free energy principle? I, I could. It would take a long time um, <laughs> in, in the sense that um, the notion of predictive processing, um, which I tend to regard as something called active inference, uh, I, I think was probably born in the days of Plato, um, was um, articulated in philosophy by people like Kant and then taken up in a much more um, by physical uh, sense by Helmholtz um, in the 19th century, and then has a... Um, a sort of fluctuating history throughout the 20th century, um, suppressed to a certain extent by behaviorism um, and um, sort of a focus on the overt behavior of systems, things like reinforcement learning. But underneath that, there was uh, there were, were notions um, of things like analysis by synthesis, um, perception as hypothesis testing, perceptual control theory, the cybernetics movement, things like the good regulator theorem. All of these are probably quite obscure notions uh, nowadays, but they do speak to a very rich and enduring legacy of this style of thinking. And this style of thinking is quite simply um, the sentient artifacts, sentient creatures, brains, you and me, are in the game of predicting what would happen if I did that or what would happen if I was right about the state of the world that's generating my sensations. So it's um, a construction or a view of sentient behavior 
which puts the brain very much in a, an active and constructive mode that it's generating hypotheses, explanations that are a best fit to the sensory evidence supplied by the outside world. So that's the emphasis on predictive, the processing, information processing. I would read that as inference or learning, um, depending upon the time scale. So you put the two together, you get predictive, uh, predictive processing, which is now, um, the term is interesting. Um, I think it was probably um, due to Andy Clark, who's you know one of the, the world's most famous um, philosophers and certainly neurophilosophers. And um, I think he, he brought it to the table um, to provide a label for a more generic way of understanding sense making in the service of inaction in a situated context in an, in an inactive context um, in a way that distinguished it from very particular instances or implementations such as predictive coding um, so predictive coding was something that had been around for compressing sound files since the since the um, the 1950s um, but suddenly was a focus uh, of attention in the neurosciences as a plausible way of compressing data via prediction in a really efficient way um, in the spirit of sense making and perception. So what Andy wanted to do, I think, was say, well, yes, th that's fine. But predictive coding in and of itself doesn't have this inactive, situated, embedded aspect to it. Uh, so let's think about the sort of you know how you'd make how you'd make predictive coding work in an artifact that actually had to go and gather its own data and exchange and act upon the world. So that's that's my view of predictive processing, uh, and the reason for the active inference is it, it emphasizes the active part. But under the hood, um, all of these processes, all of these ways of framing sense making, uh, can be expressed as the process of inference and or learning at, 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 at a longer time scale. So is the addition that you're making uh, going from just looking at it as a as a sensation information loop to adding active inference to it, so adding actual movement to it? That's absolutely right, yeah. Um, I mean, something obviously which people have been acutely aware of um, you know, you have the four E's movement, you know, extended, embedded, and you know, and so on. Um, you have notions of the action perception cycle. So in, in both of these sort of, um, well, we could almost say paradigm shifts at the beginning of this century, there's this uh, realisation that closing the circle between, as you put it, the sort of the, uh, the information, the sense-making, um, the feed, you know, the... the, the, the coupling from the environment into the um, the sense-making organ or the brain, um, closing the circle, literally a perception action circle, by now saying, well, now the brain um, is in charge of setting uh, the set points for its actuators, its reflexes, so that it can act upon the world that then generates more data. So you're closing the loop. So you've got sort of a bi-directional, a circular causality in play, which makes things much, much more interesting. So, you know, sometimes I like to think of this in terms of, you know, pre-active inference and pre-sort um, of uh, predictive processing um, formulations of sentient behavior, certainly in the cognitive sciences and possibly even in machine learning, um, that you, you were thinking about pure sense-making um, and how that um, could be articulated in terms of inference, very much along the lines of um, how a statistician would make sense of data, how a machine learning person would do some classification, would recognize things. But then you put on top of that, okay, what are you going to do about that? And of course, when, as soon as you put that into the game, then you have to address the rather vexed and intriguing question, okay, I've got these data and I've made sense of them, but now I'm in charge of gathering the data that I'm making sense of. And now you have a model which is much more apt for describing things like you and me and indeed scientists. You know, what do they do? They spend half their time performing experiments. They're acting on the world to generate some data. Then they try and make sense of it. They test the hypotheses. So it's, it, it, you know, that sort of circular causality, that action perception cycle, I think is quite fundamental to, 
um, this account of self-organization. Right, right. It's a, it's a tricky history because, I mean, at some point we had a break away from behaviorism in looking at the brain as input-output to seeing the deep, deep nuances and, and complexities of the action perception cycle. But it's it's never clear where that break happened, um, if it was a one-pointer or, or how it developed. It seems like a long story to get to it. Yeah, yes, uh, and you're probably in a better position to to, <laughs> to summarize that narrative. Uh, you know, from my perspective, it it really has been a uh, almost a yin yang uh, from what I know of the history. And of course, we were both too young to really know what actually was going on. But certainly, the the rise of behaviorism and then its demise. Um, you know, when you know, um, you know, with a, a greater focus on inference and classification and um, hypothesis testing. Um, and then uh, perhaps nowadays, perhaps in this century, uh, the two are seen to work hand in hand. Per per perhaps that dialectic is is not quite so quite so evident. Um, but yeah, you know, it would be fascinating to read a book about you know all the different waves of understanding different kinds of intelligence o over the past two centuries now. I would imagine. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it's spread out through so many fields and disciplines and people that it's very tricky to sort it all out. Um, yeah. Okay. So moving on, uh, the free energy principle. Uh, do you mind just describing the free energy principle? Right. No, not at all. Um, there are two ways of describing it. I can either describe it from the bottom up or from the top down. So in a sense, I think we've already covered the, the basic tenets of the free energy principle from a sort of low road bottom up um, approach, understood or read through the eyes of um, people trying to understand their own behavior and the behavior of um, um, animals and other biological uh, creatures, biological biotic self-organization. Um, and that story is basically, what are the imperatives for good predictive processing? Well, it's quite simple. Um, you just basically want to minimize your surprise. Well, what does that mean? Well, it just basically means um, being able to predict reliably, veridically, the, the sensations that you're encountering, both in the moment and as a consequence of, of, of moving. But in the moment, this is a sort of the predictive coding perspective. In the moment, if I've got um, some sensations and I want um, an explanation that is most apt for describing those sensations, then I have to have a model that articulates and expresses my explain, explanation of what produced, what generated those, those sensations. That's in my world called a, a generative model. Um, in machine learning, it might be called a world model, um, an internal model, irrespective of what you want to call it. It's basically a probabilistic specification of what I would see if this was the state of the world out there. And if I now um, want to minimize my surprise, that is exactly the same as saying I want to render my beliefs about what's going on out there um, such that these sensations, these data are the least surprising, technically have the highest marginal likelihood given my model of the world. So that quantity underwrites nearly all imperatives and um, objective functions in statistics and the machine learning and evolution, uh, wherever you look, this fundamental quantity, this sort of, um, uh, I've called it surprise, you could also call it the log marginal likelihood, you could also call it the logarithm of the model evidence, the evidence for a particular uh, model of some data. If you're a, a, um, in theoretical biology and your evolutionary theorist, you, you might even call it adaptive fitness. It's just the, the likelihood of a particular phenotype being a good fit for or being a good model of um, the its eco-niche or, or its environment. So wherever you look, um, this, this fundamental uh, quantity um, appears to be optimized uh, in the sense, and it will look as if uh, you are basically just positioning yourself or sampling the world in order to minimize surprise. And when you take this notion into the inactive domain, um, clearly in choosing what to do next, 
you don't have the sensations that ensue before you've made the movement. So now you have to appeal to, well, what would I see if I did that? And then you choose what to do on the basis of minimizing the expected surprise, the surprise expected following that particular plan relative to another plan. Technically, that's called um, entropy or uncertainty. So all we're saying is that we act in a way to res to minimize the uncertainty about what um, the uncertainty about the causes of our uh, of our sensations. So that link, I think, is is also useful uh, in our conversation because it's, it says um, you now have an opportunity to express this imperative in terms of information theory. So because this fundamental quantity, this uh, model evidence or this marginal likelihood or adaptive fitness um, um, can be written as uh, um, self-information in information theory, which is an, you know, another word, a technical description of surprisal or surprise, whereas the average of the self-information or surprisal is entropy. So it all fits together very beautifully and licenses now a description of this uh, characterization of self-organizing systems in terms of information theory. And that's where the free energy principle gets you know, gets into the game. And you may be asking, well, why free energy? Um, and I can tell you, I'm not sure how much depth to go into, perhaps very briefly. Um, it would be um, um, a simple um, and almost tautological um, problem um, if we just describe uh, systems as minimizing their self-information or minimizing their surprise or minimizing their surprise. However, that would entail the, um, the ability of any system to actually evaluate this marginal likelihood or this fundamental quality of the surprise. Mathematically, you can't do that. You can't physically realize this. So um, what you do or what one does is when you, you're faced with these impossible integration, inference, marginalization problems, is to create it into an optimization problem by inducing a quantity that you can measure, you can represent, you can compute, um, that is always um, a bound in the sense it's always smaller than or bigger than the thing you want to um, maximize or minimize. Um, so in machine learning, that bound is known as an evidence lower bound. So if you recall, surprise, mm. surprisal is um, the negative surprisal is the is the logarithm of the evidence, the model evidence. So the evidence lower bound now becomes this variation of free energy, which means that if you keep on pushing it up, you're guaranteed to actually maximize to within the bound approximation the thing that you want to um, you want to maximize or you think is maximized by sentient creatures or um, um, things that exchange in a sort of Bayes optimal way. You know, take reading reading this in terms of of, of inference in physics. Um, the signs change. So in physics, uh, you want to minimize the free energy. So you have to multiply everything by minus one. This is very confusing for everybody. Right. Uh, but it has right. to be said. So uh, what that means is that this um, bound approximation uh, that was um, invented um, on most readings of the history by Richard Feynman when he was converting an impossible path integral um, literally in the path integral formulation of quantum electrodynamics, that integration problem was insoluble. Um, so he converted it into an optimization problem by equipping academia um, with this uh, variational free energy bound using variational calculus. Um, and in that world, you want to minimize the free energy. And um, this in turn, is exactly what uh, people like E.T. James were saying when they were talking about physics as measurement, physics as a process of inference. And of course, because free energy is equal to some expected energy minus the entropy, minimizing free energy now becomes a maximum entropy principle. So the maximum entropy principle just is the free energy principle. Uh, yeah. Qualified by the fact that, of course, we're talking about a maximum entropy principle under constraints. Where did the constraints come from? Well, they come from that 
um, that expected energy. What is that energy? It's just the expected surprise or, or the surprise, or it's the um, the accuracy, if you like, with which you can uh, predict your current sensations given given a particular hypothesis or measurement or inference about what generated those particular uh, the, those particular uh, measurements. So I've just given you. Um, uh, a bit of the top-down high road um, uh, explanation for the free energy principle, but um, uh, on the back of um, linking uh, predi uh, predictive processing to the physics of sentience via the uh, via information theory, there is actually one more part of the story that really is the free energy principle, and that's the observation that any system that individuates itself from the rest of the universe that is statistically separable in some in a certain sense from the rest of the universe um, must have a dynamics that looks as if it's doing a gradient flow on this exactly exactly the same quantity a gradient flow on the physicists um, free energy or you know, um, if you if if you um, take out the bound, um, this is just on the surprisal, um, which means that now you can understand neuronal dynamics, the dynamics of message passing and belief propagation, as something that is necessarily part of the dynamics of any system that manages to maintain itself as individuated or separate from um, its embedding space or its environment or or, or, or eco niche. Right. So, so then, can we use that as as a benchmark to, as a criteria for life? That any system that resists entropy and uses that principle um, is a living system, and then we can find a line from where there's no life, and then there's life. I know that's a very uh, touchy subject, and uh, probably, I'm probably generalizing far more than that's what's allowed. But. Oh no! Yeah, no. I think it's a, I think it's a great subject and a great question. Um, so. And it's something which is occupying um, many of my colleagues who are um, thinking about the applications of the free energy principle. I should just qualify this. The free energy principle in and of itself is not terribly useful. Um, you know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, Hamilton's principle of least action, you know, or uh, the theory of natural selection. You know, knowing it is very pleasing and it, you know, it's sort of conceptually nice and pretty and round and it makes a lot of sense, uh, but it doesn't actually do very much for you until you apply it. Um, so you have to apply the free energy principle to something. And usually that something is um, a description of um, a, a self-organizing system with a particular generative model. So, you know, so I just, just make that point. Um, but a lot of people are now thinking about, well, what kinds of systems and what kinds of generative models would license you to draw a bright line between systems that persist over time that are non-living versus biotic systems. And then within biotic systems, um, you know, to what extent can they, they be thought of as agents and having a degree of autonomy? And then within those, uh, to what extent can you ascribe them um, uh, sentience? And to what, and then within those, to what extent can you ascribe them self awareness and, and uh, consciousness? And you know, so there are, you know, I think this is a really great question. In answer to your question, I would very simply say that um, systems that look as if they comply with the free energy principle, um, or, or actually by definition, to, to exist as a system means that you are separable from not system, and therefore you must comply with the free energy principle. Um, but um, you can comply with it in different ways. And, and um, um, one key thing I think that does draw a bright line between living and non-living is the ability to move. It's really, really simple. Um, technically, in my world, that separation is mediated by something called a Markov blanket. So you've got this notion of um, you know, carving up all the states of a universe into four parts. The first are the states that are internal to the system. Say, for example, your neural activity and connectivity. Um, and then the second part are the external states, everything in the outside world that might include your body if, if your internal states were your brain states. And then crucially, the thing that individuates or separates or distinguishes that keeps apart statistically the inside from the outside. And that's the Markov blanket. And that can be carved into two 
one is mediates the influences of the inside on the uh, of the of the outside on the inside so one way traffic and then the other one is the um the states that mediate the influence of the inside on the uh, on the uh, outside again it's one way traffic to a certain extent and it's that one way traffic that preserves its distinction um so that 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 construct um then suggests that there's a very simple taxonomy of things um that first of all do and do not possess active states so what does that mean well it just means that they can't act upon their world so a stone doesn't you know if you looked at a stone and you looked at a tortoise um you know uh, forget about everything else the reason you might think the tortoise was a living and the stone wasn't is simply because it moves and that's just an expression of having active states to complete that sort of markov blanket or um, sometimes referred to as a particular partition the reason for particular partition is that you know as a physicist you might regard the internal states and their blanket states as a particle in a universe um so that would be the first thing so i'd say that living stuff is are just things that um endure over time in virtue of the fact that they are moving so is 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 this why the the low road and the high road distinction has been useful uh in implying the free energy principle if you have a high road where you sort of just know what the what the directive is what the what the objective function will look like then it's easier for people doing that work because they just have that reference point rather than uh, having the whole constructive history. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to read your question as saying, you know, what's the utility of having something like a free energy principle? And, and if you meant it in that spirit, then absolutely. It just provides a relatively uh, simple account of the way that things are and the way that things behave or must be must behave if they exist and then within that uh, relatively straightforward uh, bit of physics and differential equations and density dynamics um, then you can see the kinds of behaviors that you are very much interested in if you are uh, an economist or you're in machine learning or you are in um, uh, cognitive neuroscience um, and you know you can see how all your favorite schemes and ideas suddenly have to be right and have to be enacted and also how they relate to each other and all the special cases you get and you've just identified a really special case which is the non-living thing that exists and possibly is making lots of sense it's still probably doing predictive coding so just think about the stone the internal states of the stone will equilibrate thermodynamically with the temperature of the surface it's markov blanket so it's still making sense of modeling its environment in the sense it's representing the temperature of its local external milieu. Uh, but of course, it's not moving. So, you know, so you're stuck in the 20th century without worry. Uh, you're stuck in the days of predictive coding because you haven't thought about what, you know, can the same imperatives of minimizing surprise or, or expected free energy um, in a physicist sense uh, can they also be applied to the way that we act? And of course, then you start to think about, well, what would that look like? Well, it would simply mean um, acting or changing, acting upon the external states in a way to minimize surprise. What would that be? It would be a thermostat. It would be a homeostat. It would just be the simplest uh, description of the simplest kind of biological self-organization namely the physiology of homeostasis, keeping things within bounds, minimizing surprises about excursions from um, um, uh, equilibrium or set points that, that characterize the creature, the creature at hand. And expressing like that immediately takes you back to the 1940s and the, uh, the inception of cybernetics. Uh, uh, for example, Rosh Ash Ashby's homeostat. Uh, which is just about this, you know, this kind of um, just simple imperative, just keeping things within bounds. And how do you sort of position yourself so that you can keep things in uh, within bounds using this simple reflex-like sort of circular causality between perception and action of a very, very elemental sort. Um, 
So, you know, that's, you know, to my mind, a nice illustration of how all these things suddenly fit together under relatively simple uh, physics or mechanics um, that, 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 um, afforded just by thinking about the fundaments of um, of how you know, what a thing is and how it um, maintains its separation from the rest of the world just by keeping certain states sensed states within within bounds and using that kind of language you see immediately well this is exactly what people um in biology were trying to articulate when they're talking about autopoiesis you know self-assembly self-creation more like self-maintenance from my perspective but you know you you get the spirit uh, if you're a chemist you're talking about self-assembly uh, and then you can start talking about, oh, well, it, does this relate to Turing pattern formation, reaction diffusion systems? What are special about these kinds of things? And then you say, oh, I see. They're just statements of steady state pattern formation far from equilibrium. So immediately now back to the physics, the information theoretic physics um, of um non-equilibrium steady states, which is where we started with the free energy principle, trying to work out the dynamics of something that is an open exchange with its environment, with its heat bath, if you like, uh, via this permeable Mark Markov blanket. So it, it all starts, starts hanging together. I should just mention other things which people get upset when we ignore, or when when, 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 when I ignore, uh, things like perceptual control theory. Um, so, you know, the, the notion that all of our purposeful behavior is just in the service of keeping our sensations, our sensed world within uh, viable, viable bounds. And, and, you know, that's a, a, a sufficient explanation of any of any behavior. And they're absolutely right. It's just keeping that surprise down. Right. So, OK, going back to going back to the 4E approaches or 4EA, I should say, um, do you how do you feel about like the strong version of the of the claim that that all perception is in some sense um, influenced by the affordance that is related the, the affordance of how you could interact with that perception right right yeah that's a subtle question because you've introduced the notion of affordance there do, will, will, all, will all the listeners know what affordance means or do you want to just unpack uh, the importance of that um, concept yeah i mean I, I think you could do a far better job than i but uh just simply the idea that um when you're in perception, there's this bias where you're constructing perceptual models based on how you can interact with with whatever is being perceived uh, in a very very elementary way. But I'm sure you could do a far better job than me. No, I, I can't improve upon that. So, uh, so yeah. Um, so your question is about um, radical inactivism, and does that fit comfortably um, with, with our with our theoretical thinking? Um, I have to confess it, it, it doesn't really, but I'm I say that in a qualified way because I change my story depending on who I'm talking to. So I, I, I'm quite happy batting for both sides. So, so <laughs> it, it depends. So I have friends in philosophy who are committed skeptics and committed realists, and um, uh, so I you know I will change my my nuancing or my interpretation of the free energy principle to suit who I'm talking to. In a sense, so I think the free energy principle um, does dissolve some of that dialectic, um, but it still leaves, I think, big open questions. So radical inactivism in and of itself is just a little bit too radical for my taste. Um, and the reason is the whole point of inference um, or casting sentient behavior as a process of inference and learning is that you are belief updating, that you are, you know, if you define inference as basically changing your mind in order to better infer what's going on out there, cast in terms of abdu abductive reasoning as opposed to inductive or deductive re reasoning, you immediately are in the world of beliefs, probability, and I, I should qualify that, when I talk about these things, I don't mean sort of folk psychology beliefs or propositional beliefs. I'm talking about Bayesian beliefs, conditional probability distributions, whose sufficient statistics are physically embodied in your neural activity or your, or your connectivity. But crucially, they still have a mathematical description of beliefs. And if you your whole framework is predicated on effectively um, 
a description of Bayesian belief updating articulated information theory, it's rather difficult to deny the possibility of representations <laughs> yeah, simply because <laughs> these are probabilistic representations. And, uh, you know, all, all I would do if confronted with a radical inactivist is, is rush away and find a friend in quantum physics. Because in quantum physics, everything is a belief. It's all about, there's nothing but probabilistic descriptions, inferences, uh, wave functions, probability distributions, Bayesian beliefs. Uh, so that all of physics really uh, is, is sort of, um, I think, beyond the reach of radical, uh, of radical inactivism. So uh, for me, radical inactivism is a little bit too radical because it denies representation. However, that doesn't mean to say that, you know, you can still adopt a sort of, um, you know, either a realist or anti-realist approach um, and, uh, and look at that approach or stance through the lens of the free energy principle and ask, does it have any currency? And I think both both approaches, uh, both views, I think, do have some currency. One, the whole point or the, um, the, the foundation of the Bayesian mechanics that inherits from the free energy principle simply is this separation of the particle or the thing from the rest of the um, the universe, and in that separation, what that means is that the the Bayesian mechanics, the uh, constrained maximum entropy principle, as applied to the internal states, is forever secluded from the external states. So you'll never know what's going on out there. Uh, there is no way of knowing. If there was a way of knowing, if there was a way of um, uh, establishing some direct contact, some direct causal influence, influences from the outside to the inside, you would have breached your Markov blanket and you would cease to be the thing that you were. So by definition, to be something means you can never know what everything else is. Um, so that, that fits comfortably with a sceptical position. Uh, but the problem is that if you're um, the other, the realist position is, of course, if you're making inferences about something that is meant to be uh, generating your sensations, the sensory states of your Markov blanket, um, then there has to be something out there doing that. So that takes you to a realist position. Uh, but I think you can argue for both sides if you, if you really wanted to. Do you think do you think evolutionary processes play play a role here? Um, Donald Hoffman has argued from the evolutionary standpoint that that although there is something out there, um, all you have to do is look at look at the rules, the models that govern evolutionary behavior, and then you could ask the question whether they would optimize for a system that has that preserves some sort of homomorphism with what's going on outside or not. And then he argues that they don't. There, there's a zero probability that they do. Um, yeah, what, what do you think about that? Um, well, I think, and um, I should say. Uh, quite a number of my international colleagues also think that there's a, there's a really profound and illuminating link between um, this formulation of um, um, self-organization in terms of a Bayesian mechanics or a, a, a sort of belief updating description of how we optimize our beliefs and, mo and generative models and evolution itself. Um, so that can be, if you like, um, expressed at a number of different levels. Uh, you know, an implicit, again, it's a really good question because it actually speaks a little bit to what we were just talking about in terms of you know, what's on the outside. Um, so the first thing to say is that I think it's now among the people I talk to. So I, you know, I, I don't know if there are people out there who like an argument who don't take this position, but the people I talk to would certainly accept that evolution just is um a um a surprise or um model evidence um um minimizing risk maximizing respectively process um and the way that's normally articulated is um in the following sense that if you read optimization of the model evidence or its free energy bound um as uh, model selection so say i've got two models in play that I can bring to the table to explain all these sensory exchanges, say over a lifetime. Um, and the two models are now scored in terms of their goodness, how optimal they are, how fit they are, or how fit for purpose they are in that environment generating those sensory exchanges. 
So we're talking about adaptive fitness, basically, where we're reading adaptive fitness as the likelihood that this model would fit with this environment, that it could predict and uh, explain all its environmental exchanges. So if you read now um, the selection or Bayesian model selection as simply the, um, the selection of the model with the highest evidence or the highest adaptive fitness, you now have a mathematical image of natural selection. So it's I don't think that evolution, if you like, um, uh, sets the scene for the emergence of the free energy principle. I certainly do not think that. I think evolution is an example of the free energy principle. And it's an example of the surprise minimization, the evidence maximization, the adaptive fitness maximization, when you get a separation of scales. And that's the big point I wanted to get to, which speaks to what we talked about before. So, you know, when you start to deploy or apply the free energy principle, um, uh, as many people are currently doing, um, at ensembles of things and at different scales, you now reach this really interesting um, question. Well, what would happen if all of these particles were um, uh, maximizing their, uh, their model evidence? Sometimes uh, people like Jakob Howey, uh, another uh, um, world-renowned uh, philosopher would refer to as self-evidencing as a, you know, a, a shorthand for this kind of Bayesian mechanics or self-organization. If if you had a whole bunch of um, things, say cells or people, um, um, who are all self-evidencing with their own little Markov blankets, all individuated um, nicely, but exchanging with each other, um, mm. what would happen if now the whole ensemble had its own Markov blanket. So now you have a community of cells. And then what would happen if that community of communities had its own national boundary? Um, and you start now to think about the this kind of basic me mechanics playing out at different scales, both in space and in time. So I would regard evolution as simply a Bayesian model selection pr uh, process that plays out very, very slowly on a sort of transgenerational level. And what it's doing, it's selecting for those phenotypes or generative models that on a much faster scale do all the sense making and the and the predictive processing that we um, that we try and study and celebrate in say cognitive science or or, or machine learning. Um, but at both scales, exactly the same uh, mechanics is going on. It's just a gradient flow or a, um, a, a can be read as an optimization process, which is minimizing the physicist's free energy, which is an attribute of the beliefs entailed by a particular physical uh, structure, um, you know, of the uh, of the internal states of of a thing. So, I think that sort of um, putting or applying the free energy principle in this um, in this uh, in this hierarchical and scale invariant context is a really important move because what it tells you is you can't look at any individual thing in isolation you always have to think about you know the context in which is which it operates so um you know one way of saying that is that in order for my um dendritic processes in a hippocampal neuron to oscillate at a gamma frequency i have to have the right neural circuit the right brain region, the right neural population, which has its own Markov blanket, in order for that um, functionally specialized neuronal, distributed neural circuit to exist, it has to exist in the context of a larger organ with the right functional architectures, and the right Markov blankets, and the right integration, namely the brain. In order for that to exist, it has to exist in a body. In order for the body to exist, it has to exist in a family or a community, in order for the community, and even go right up to Gaia and beyond. An increasing an increasing spatial temporal scales, but the same principles are operating at every scale. So at every scale, if there is something there, whether it's a species uh, or an ecosystem, it must have a Markov boundary by definition in in my world, uh, and therefore must there must be some aspect of its dynamics that look as if uh, it uh, the 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 in the states internal to that thing that define the Markov blanket that defines uh, the thing in question at the scale in question must uh, be minimizing a um, a bound on the uh, 
um, the log model evidence and indeed the, the model evidence itself for that collective and that has to hold at every, uh, 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 every scale. So that would be another way of dissolving the realist, um, anti-realist um, argument that, you know, it depends upon what scale you, you, you're operating. Uh, so from the point of view of my brain, I can have an argument with a philosopher about being skeptical. But from the if uh, if, if uh, but from the point of view of um, that cell in my hippocampus, I can't have that kind of argument. <laughs> it doesn't it really doesn't matter. It's not on the right. It's not posed at the right at the right scale. Uh, and of course, you can't. Well, actually, I was going to say you can't have countries arguing about that to a certain extent because they argue about other things, don't they? Do you think, just as a side, do you think that has implications for the idea of identity or or self? Um, in that the scale at which you can identify the Markov blanket is is useful in in figuring out what the self is, what the system that you're looking at is. So if the Markov blanket is at the state, is at the scale of a, of a society, then you're looking at a society. If it's at the scale of um, uh, 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 people in a market making rational decisions, then you're looking at an economy and so on and so forth. Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, another very astute question there. I mean, I personally am not working um, explicitly on this, um, but there are many people who are earnestly and uh, in quite an excited way working on this, ranging from um, people um, who are trying to uh, induce a move away from behavioural economics to cognitive economics, so sort of actually get uh, um, uncertainty uh, and confidence in the market into a formal calculus and a, and a mechanics that you can actually simulate and predict and understand how markets and and traders and, and you know how institutions behave and respond and act upon their external milieu, which you know of course is composed of other institutions. So you know these the, 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 to to, to um, leverage or realize the. Um, the potential of the free energy principle in application, the first step is to identify those particular partitions. You're absolutely right. So identifying what is a thing, once you've identified what a thing is, then your job is basically building or deciding what kinds of internal architectures, the structure of institution or the structure of your brain, or indeed the intracellular structure of a neuron. Um, what, what kinds of structures, computational architectures, um, usually sparse ones, would be required to provide an explanation for all the sensory information that's impinging upon that particular boundary. Uh, so if you were a cell, it'd be presynaptic inputs. If you were an organization, uh, it would be all the transactions, all the data that you had available, say from the stock markets, um, you know, orders coming in at reception or on your website. So it's quite easy to identify the the sensory states of, of anything the question the deeper question then is what kind of generative model would be apt for explaining how these sensations were generated once you've done that you can then use Bayesian model selection indeed you can even use evolution using evolutionary algorithms if you wanted to to optimize that generative model um and um, then once you once you've done that, you can start to simulate and understand the mechanics and start to you know, do scenario modeling and understand self-organization and uh, things like uh, niche construction. Um, it could be cultural niche construction, the emergence of language, for example. So niche construction is a nice example of what you can do if you associate um, a phenotype with one kind of Markov blanket and ask um, how does action of that phenotype uh, on the environment um, unfold while appeal while referring back to the free energy uh, principle, which says that there's a there's a beautiful symmetry here um, in the sense that um, the Markov blanket that, that separates me from the rest of the environment is exactly the same Markov blanket that separates the environment from me. So as much as I'm um, learning and inferring about my world, my world is learning and inferring about me at some elemental level. And we, you know, there's another bright line there, but um, um, in principle, the environment simply um, in virtue of the existence of a Markov blanket, which means that I am not part of my environment, means the environment must be learning about me. And you can read that basically as the environment being sensitive 
to its sensations that are my actions. And that basically means I'm designing my environment. I'm um, creating changes in my environment. So from my point of view, the environment becomes more predictable so that I'm minimizing my surprise. From the environment's point of view, it's learning about how its denizens, its inhabitants behave. Um, and so it's making it, the environment's making it easier for its inhabitants to predict. So we get things like traffic signs and roads and language and elephant paths and desire paths. And, you know, so all of this is, it sort of emerges from thinking about the exchange between different blanketed systems. It gets even more interesting when you start to think about um, another thing that is very similar on the same spatial scale as me. Now, I think you're getting into the game of self versus other and self-awareness. I think, you know, it is, I'd, if I was living in a universe where there was just me and the rest of my environment and there was nothing like me and there was nothing living in that environment, then all the causes of changes must be caused by me. I wouldn't need a sense of self because, you know, it would, it would, explore, it would provide no extra explanatory power. But if that universe included other things like me who are also acting in their, uh, you know, in their efforts of uh, niche construction, I'm now faced with an inference problem. Did you cause that or did I cause that? Uh, at this point, I now need to have a mental, a generative model or an internal world model that says uh, things can be caused either by me or things like me, namely others. And I think at that point, you now have a sense of self. So the, here's one of these other bright lines um, that rests upon the, the situated context in which I'm trying to um, create a good model and make good inferences about my world. And of course, for you and me, 99.9% .9 of all our sensations are caused by things like us. So we're always in the game of, did you, did you do that? Or did I mean that? Or, you know, uh, and ultimately, you know, one, one nice and common theme um, in when you start to simulate these processes is that if the ultimate imperative of all of us is to minimize our surprise and minimize our uncertainty um, in the moment, then that means that we should all start to share the same generative model because that means that i can predict what you will do because it's what i would do and you get this notion of um a shared narrative or a common ground in a sort of thomas, uh, thomas um, um you know in in various uh, parts of um 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 psychology um or, or ethology um mathematically what that looks like is generalized synchronization um, that you get the same dynamics in two systems that are mutually and reciprocally trying to exchange and infer each other. So inevitably you get this convergence to uh, the same kind of dynamics simply because, or that can be read as a shared generative model or a shared world, world view with a shared language and a shared, um, uh, you know, a, a shared yes I, you know, language i think is probably the best description of it you know it doesn't have to be a spoken language but you know a shared commitment and understanding of your actions that become my sensations and and vice versa and then that leads to interesting questions well why do we have arguments why do we have trump versus biden <laughs> why do we have wars <laughs> so we can talk about that if you wanted to right so at each level like the, the only knobs that you have to, the only dials that you have to move are either the evidence or the model, right? I mean, I know it's more complicated than that, but, but at each level, what constitutes the evidence and what constitutes the model uh, shifts so differently and, and you need such different language and conceptual tools to understand it. And I think that makes it very tricky to think about it um, from the scale of a brain to the scale of an economy to a society. Yes, but in a sense, you know that that that, that is exactly the um, the problem or the aspiration that you described earlier on. I mean, if you can if you can define the particular partition, what are sensory states, what are active states, what are control variables in engineering, uh, what is my system, what are internal states to my system, what's external, I, I think you've got a long way to actually making that conceptualization less tricky for anybody. 
Yeah. But I'm not saying that's easy. I mean, that's you know, that's that's the first hard part in in in, in if you like hypothesizing a particular generative model is it's basically working out what are the boundaries of the thing that I'm trying to model or to understand or to explain. Um, but I think the, the solution or the key to making it a useful, untricky business is identifying that partition, that 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 thing that distinguishes the system of interest from everything else. Um, and there's quite a lot of work in maths um, at the moment um, looking at sort of automated ways of trying to partition the world in, in, into lots of little Markov blankets to understand at a particular scale, and then to understand, try to understand and try to model, you know, what would happen if I if I then applied the free energy principle to generative models. But there was another profound truth, though, in, in your question. You, you were saying, you know, the thing that... Um, the only thing that I need to describe how something will change is this um, functional, i.e. a function of a function of two things, the data, the sensory states, and the model. And that's so true. You know? So you can either change the sensory states through action, or you can change the model by changing your mind. Uh, and again, we come back to this, you know, this, this sort of, uh, nice way of viewing a distinction between action and perception. So there, you know, at a very simple level, whether I'm a cell or a brain or an institution, um, or uh, you know, I think that that that's very simple duality um, pervades in terms of this sort of generalization of action and perception. I can, you know, to make things less surprising, I can either say, oh, actually, that's not surprising. That's exactly what I would have predicted by changing my mind about the way the world, world works. Or I can sh move to ignore that and sample something else which is more predictable. So I can choose which news channel to, to, to watch. So, you know, if I'm watching a news channel, everything I find really surprising and so sort of ego is astonic. I can go, I've got two ways of responding. I, I can say, oh, perhaps I was wrong. Perhaps my ideology needs to be nuanced in this direction so that I'm not surprised by people saying this or people telling me that. Or I'm going to watch the other channel because <laughs> that's more, more for people like me. Both of them are perfectly viable solutions to minimizing your surprise. Or, and in a sense, that's, that's what we do all the time. You know, we're constantly changing our mind and then changing the evidence uh, uh, upon which we um, make those inferences that enables us to change our mind. Okay, so how would you, just for fun, how would you do that for politics? Uh, what does that language for a political system, a political Markov blanket look like? Right, so um, I'm not going to give you a very deep answer there. I suspect you probably could could have a more poetic answer than, than I could, but it is interesting that people are starting to try and simulate this kind of thing. Um, by simulating lots of little artificial active inference agents all doing their predictive processing together uh, in a minimal context. So I'm thinking here of um, um, friend, uh, uh, friends of mine who um, um, simulated the emergence and prevalence of different ideas um, by simulating tweets, basically. So... Um, what they what they've done, in fact, two two groups of friends of mine have been doing this. They've asked, well, if everybody is in the game, every artifact, every particle, every person, every tweeter, is in the game of um, um, trying to minimise their surprise, and they are broadcasting their messages and their memes. Um, what will happen if you put a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand of these agents together? Um, and what tends to happen is something very interesting. You basically get a partition into in, into two groups, and it's usually 50-50. And then you ask yourself, oh, that's interesting. And I can't remember, but somebody told me that there's a, a law which says that you know, in, in voting dynamics or, um, uh, or indeed in terms of population dynamics, this, this is... Uh, this is unsurprising. There's a mathematical basis for it. But um, certainly using numerical experiments, this is an emergent property of um, of these kinds of simulations where lots of sort of sentient little active inference particles um, are in exchange with each other. One argument is that, of course, it couldn't be any other way. This is the only evolutionary stable state in the sense if one small group 
um, existed, it would quickly get absorbed into the other group by this process of shared narratives and generalized synchrony. So the only stable solution is to have a 50-50 split. But then you ask, well, why don't they just merge? Uh, and the answer to that is, is still, I think, outstanding. And perhaps somebody's got an answer. But I, I think it, 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 the answer lies in the initial conditions and the heterogeneity that you know, people, um, people bring to the table when they start their, their exchanges. Um, but also something more subtle on, on top of that, which is um, th something that comes when you start to think about agents that plan. Now, previously we were talking about sort of homeostats and, and uh, 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 thermostats and reflexes and the like. And all of these things are um, beautiful in, in instantiations of very simple um, Bayesian mechanics and, and the very trivial um, uh, you know, um, generative models. You know, basically, I believe that this room temperature should be 16.8 uh, degrees. And if it departs from that, I'm surprised and I'm going to act in a way to reduce my surprise and bring the temperature simply by turning on the heater. So very simple little circuits that can be interpreted through the lens of the spacing mechanics. You know, I'm not saying that this is how the thermostat is working, but you, know, you can describe its dynamics and its behavior uh, using this kind of basic mechanics. And you can simulate it in, in silica should you wish to. Um, but notice... That's got active states. You could actually say that in some sense it was living. Uh, it certainly is a product of a living, um, uh, you know, somebody built the thermostat. In the absence of life, there wouldn't be any thermostats of that sort. Um, but it's not, it's not got the, the kind of biological aspect that you might you might aspire to when thinking about biological agents. There's no purposeness there. There's no um there's no ability to plan. And you know, it's really simple. That ability to plan, I think, is really important. And what does that mean from the point of view of the nature of the generative model? Well, it simply means that to plan is to have a prediction of the consequence of action in the future. And simply saying in the future immediately says you've got the kind of generative model that is freed from the moment. So this is like uh, Jerry Edelman's remembered present. So you've got a generative model now that acquires a temporal depth. It has a horizon in the future, which is quite remarkable. Thermostat doesn't have that. A virus won't have that. You could even argue that small insects don't have that. But things that plan, things that choose to do this or that, must at some level, or at least can be described as if they had a generative model that acquires a temporal depth. And I think in that sense, as soon as you're choosing between one plan and another plan, you are truly an agent and you have a, a you know, sort of a biological autonomy, which many things don't have. Um, and that um, that brings uh, with it an interesting question, which um, brings us back to this notion of um, how do you choose the best plans if the imperative is to minimize surprise? Well, the best plan would be that which minimizes the surprise expected if you pursue that plan. And again, we come back, what does that mean? It means I'm going to resolve uncertainty, which simply means that anything that can plan that exists must look at some level as if it is curious. It will want to go and um, technically maximize its expected information game, which is the important part of this expected free energy or expected surprisal. Um, so uh, what you're saying now is that there may be another bright line between things that move um, that are not curious and things that move that are curious. And I would say that to be a true agent, you have to have that curiosity. You have to um, so move in a way that resolves uncertainty about the state of affairs out there on the basis of your actively sampled sensations. Now, if we bring that back to the 50-50 Biden-Trump split, or Brexit versus no Brexit, or whenever you look, it's, it's right down the middle. Um, then um, what that means is that the, 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 there is now an opportunity to be curious. So having somebody with a different mindset is rather interesting because it'd be interesting to know what they thought if you asked them. And of course, 
you know, when you formulate tweeting and communication, it's all about questions and answers, very much like quantum information theory. It's just sort of, you know, uh, posing questions to the universe and the universe supplying its answers in the form of sensory input. Uh, of course, that sensory input is now provided by the other group, the out group from your point of view. But it's still very attractive to do that because, of course, if you can plan, you can maximize your expected information gain, minimize your uncertainty by listening to the out group. So in, uh, in agents or particles that can plan, then this separation into uh, big groups of roughly equal size um, makes perfect sense simply because it, it provides a, a forum. It looks as if um, they are engaging in this epistemic uh, behavior and uh, in many um, in many of our writings, uh, we, re we 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 talk about that as an epistemic affordance. So, coming back to your clever and careful use of the word affordance, if I now read affordance basically as the current states, uh, the, my current uh, sensations leading to a belief about the current state of the world, that then underwrites. Um, the evaluation of a series of plans that I'm going to score in terms of my expected uh, free energy, then those that have the greatest expected free energy will have the greatest affordance. So those those cues that I have that intimate that if I did that, if I sat on that chair, this is the kind of thing I do. Then the plan to sit on that chair has the greatest affordance simply because that's the um, that I will resolve the most uncertainty by committing to that plan, because that's the kind of thing I do. Um, and this is a particular kind of surprise, um, which sometimes we call prior preferences or you know, preferred states of being. So one way to minimize the expected surprise is to avoid surprising things. So you avoid uncertainty, you avoid um, unfamiliar, unfamiliar, you avoid, for example, being um, having temperatures that are too high or too low if you if you're sort of a homeotherm uh, so you will um, avoid being very cold either by shivering or pyloerection or going inside and putting the radiators on um, so all of these behaviors are just realizations of plans that are avoiding surprising states of being um, uh, where the surprise shapes your preferences it, so to be good to be a preferred state of uh, being is just to be in a familiar characteristic set of states that characterize you rich happy loved warm well fed um, and anything that takes you away from that is surprising so you plan to avoid that so uh, that's known in my world as the uh, the um, the pragmatic uh, affordance and that basically um, is another part of the expected free energy uh, which can be written down as a, an expected cost, which is a violation of preferences, uh, you know, the expected surprise, basically. Um, and you put the expected cost together with the expected information gain, and now you've got this same sort of construct which gives you the expected free energy, which is very, very similar in mathematical form to the free energy being your um, your energy minus your entropy. Um, you have to rearrange the terms a little bit and take an expectation uh, operator, uh, apply an expectation operator. But you know, functionally speaking, there's a, there's a beautiful formal relationship between these two aspects of good plans that inherits from the way of decomposing your surprisal or your free energy bound into an energy and an entropy. Sometimes you rearrange that into a sort of accuracy and complexity. And these, this, this sort of um, decomposition survives in terms of a dual aspect imperative for plans, which is um, best summarized, I think, in terms of dual Bayesian optimality in the sense of um, maximizing expected information gain, which would be um, the, uh, pri uh, the principle of optimal Bayesian design which is if you have to design an experiment, um, then there's a particular kind of data you will get, which resolves the most uncertainty. So people literally use this in designing the good experiments as scientists. We use it all the time when we're deciding where to look next. We look where we think we're going to get the most information gain, the most salience, the most um, 
uh, resolve the most uncertainty about what caused this flutter in the periphery of my vision. But there's another part to it, which is this ex expected cost or negative expected value or expected utility, which is defined by our prior preferences. So we call that pragmatic affordance to complement the epistemic affordance. So sitting in a chair, I think, would be more the pragmatic affordance. Uh, things like me like to sit in chairs. You know, I, you know, I'm the kind of thing that sits in chairs. So if I see a chair, then uh, from the point of view of the free energy principle, this active inference application of the free energy principle, what that basically means is it's a realisation of the, um, the pragmatic affordance, simply that I would find it less surprising to be sitting in a comfortable chair than I would standing on my head beside the chair. You know, I find that more surprising, given I am me uh, age 60 plus. Um, so, the, you know, the, I, I love the word affordance um, and, and, you know, this, this direct knowledge was, was slightly um, nuancing the pure Gibsonian notion of it. But, you know, it, it survives as a really important notion that underwrites, I think, all of our planning. So bringing that back to the Biden-Trump thing, having uh, uh, another group of people that is not like-minded affords epistemic affordance for particular tweets or questions. Of course, you exist most of your time talking to your family and friends in your in-group. But from time to time, you're going to indulge in a little bit of curiosity and uh, you know, responding to those epistemic affordances of just listening to, um, you know, uh, I was going to say Fox News, but I think that would be unfair, or or you know, a news channel, or, or you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what the the, the opposite would be in, in America, ABC. I don't know. Anyway, you know, looking at two uh, um, politically polarized takes on, on on the news cycle, um, you know, you'll commit most of the time to watching this. From time to time, you'll go out there and, and, and look at the other one. And then I haven't thought about this, but you could, could get into all sorts of arguments about sort of fake news and um, the ability of big tech to actually supply you with the kind of news that they think you will expect and whether that, you know, is a base optimal in and of itself. Just anecdotally, that makes so much sense. I mean, th that, that must be why all media platforms, social media platforms especially, are are geared towards divisiveness. Like every time, let's say for example, when the when the right tries to build a platform that's insulated for itself, it doesn't work for them because there's no one to to have conflict with. There is there is no there's no two things to interact. It's just a homogeneous group. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, and and also right in a personal sense. You know, if there was no uncertainty to resolve, there's there's no opportunity to indulge in curious behaviour. And my whole life as a scientist is just an expression of responding to epistemic affordances to test hypotheses because I am curious about that. In the absence of any uncertainty, the, you know, that would be, I think, a very, very boring life. And of course, we aspire to that and we call it things like novelty seeking. You know, it's, it's why we have bungee jumping. You know, or, you know, and when you're younger, going to discos to see who you might sort of partner with that, that, that evening. You know, so all of these... All of these, you know, I think, sort of um, very fundamental and very true observations about the nature of self-organized and sentient behavior um, uh, are, are fundamentally true in the sense that they are statements that to be and to plan is, to, uh, is just to be curious. And of course, you can't be curious if there's no debate. If, if, nobody, if everybody's always right or everybody's always wrong, there's nothing to be curious about. On the other end of that, um, how far do you think agency can go from a planning perspective? Um, um, so I ask this because people people insist on sort of uh, meta uh, meta planning perspectives. Where does the ability that we can plan afford at least the the principal possibility that uh, you can step out of the process that you're embedded in and kind of rise above it? Um, sorry, I know that's a bit of a poetic. <laughs> Question. Well, no, no. I, I think it's exactly where where, where this conversation should go next. Um, and uh, you know, I'm just pu putting it, framing it in um, the, this narrative of where does one draw the bright lines between different kinds of things? Um, I like calling them natural kinds, but I've been told off by philosophers that's a bit uh, too, too. So I call them particular kinds. And I think that standing, uh, stand you know, that metacognitive aspect that you're speaking to, that standing back and looking at yourself sense-making uh, and, and planning. 
I think this is the this is the characteristic of these um, now much deeper generative models that have very deep or high um, hierarchical structures that can actually see what's going on below. And as soon as you do that, I think you now have the opportunity to be aware of things and you could possibly even argue self-aware. So I think that that's the bright line. The very thing that you've uh, brought to the table by that question is structurally the bright line that distinguishes um, systems that have either a minimal um, self-awareness or a minimal selfhood anyway. And if they are aware of that uh, or they can model or infer that minimal selfhood, then possibly full-blown self-awareness. Um, so I think that's a really important aspect. I would see it just in terms of um, the hierarchical depth of a generative model. Um, and in a slightly deflationary way, um, I would see this very much through the eyes of people like uh, you know, James Lang theory of emotions or possibly uh, Tony DiMarzio's formulation of you know, uh, you know, valence states of being and emotional states of being um, in, the, in the following very simple sense that if I've got the capacity in or the structure of a generative model that includes a hypothesis or a belief or a representation that I am something and that I can be in different states, that then enables me to contextualize or condition all my belief updating and my selection of plans in a much more fine-grained and functional way um, than if I didn't have that capacity to recognize I am in this state. So very simply, for example, if I am faced with a myriad of sensations from my body, interceptive sensations of a racing heart, um, hyperventilation, um, extra visually, uh, it's very dark. I'm, you know, I can't see what's you know what's around the corner. I can't see what's in front of me. Um, all of these, uh, this sort of profile, this particular pattern of sensory evidence, sensory impressions, um, is evidence that I'm frightened. Now, if I'm frightened, I can now um, say I am the sort of creature that uh, is frightened. And when I am frightened, I expect my body to do these kinds of things. So flight and fright responses, which means that I will now um, send down predictions that my heart should beat faster and I should breathe uh, I should breathe um, uh, more quickly if I'm just about to, to, to run away or uh, converse if I just want to attend or freeze uh, if I don't want to be noticed. Um, so, but the point being that you are now self-constructing the very signals through your body that are prov providing evidence that you're in fear and you can get into a, a little vicious cycle which usually is quite 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 functional if you are actually alone in a dark alley <laughs> and you know you're frightened is from it's pretty good that you're you maintain a degree of fear until you secure evidence that you don't need to be frightened anymore. And part of that evidence is oh my heart's slowing down now. Oh it's just a, a panic attack or it's hyperventilation. So all of that very simple story, which would justify the existence of certain creatures with generative models that have this um, very sophisticated, very deep um, representations of self in a different, in different valence or emotional states, um, I think um, uh, is exactly the kind of kind of generative model that you would require to at least have a minimal selfhood. And then you can imagine being on top of that, seeing that, oh, yes, it looks as if I'm inferring that I am frightened. Therefore, I must be frightened. And I can tell myself I'm frightened. And then I can tell you I'm frightened. And then you have self-awareness. Then, of course, there's this, this question of how far does that go? Like, is there an upper bound on how metacognitive you can become? Yeah. You know, I, I, I think that's a secret of um, philosophy and uh, the philosophy of consciousness. So <clears throat> as a younger man, <coughs> me, I, I used to think that clearly there is. Um, and there's, there's actually a mathematical bound as well as a sort of um, common sense physical bound in the size of your brain. Um, you know, the, you know the, the best model of the world, of course, is, is or map of the world is, is the world itself. The, you know, the, the best map is the territory. Um, and of course, you can't physically realize this, which is another, another argument against the, uh, the radical um, the radical inactivism. Um, 
but um, mathematically, there is also a, a, you know, a stronger, more um, uh, mathematically um, motivated bound. And that's the um, inherits from an alternative um, carving up or decomposition of the log evidence, and in, not into, in this instance, um, energy and entropy. But just by switching a couple of terms around, it now emerges in a functional form that a statistician would recognize as accuracy and complexity. So um, what that means is, as you're, maxim as you're doing your self-evidencing, it looks as if, or implicitly, you are um, generating very accurate predictions of your world as simply as possible because you're minimizing the complexity, a bit like Occam's razor. So just by being self-evidencing, and um, if you recall from the point of view that the energy principle, just being means you have to self-evidence, or you, at least it looks as if you are self-evidencing. That means you're trying to find the simplest explanation for, for all of your sensations which means that um, you can be too hierarchically deep. You can have, if you're in machine learning, this would be a little bit like um, having a, um, an overly expressive, over-parameterized um, um, uh, deep, deep network or convolutional neural network or variation autoencoder. And that over-parameterization leads to overfitting, which leads to a failure to generalize. And these are all symptoms of not uh, um, minimizing the complexity and just focusing on the accuracy or the, or the maximum likelihood part of the equation, as opposed to the maximum marginal likelihood, which is the uh, the model evidence or the self evidencing part. Um, so, uh, when you say, "Is there any upper bound on the level of meta ness in terms of self modeling?" Yes, I think there is. At some point, um, you will start to incur a complexity cost because there are too many degrees of freedom that your um, your generative model that's meant to provide the best explanations for your, all your sensations um, um, uh, will hit and after which you will become um, more complex and your um, pathological of your free energy or your surprisal um, will start to fall and literally you, you will have smaller adaptive fitness. You just won't work in this world. You won't, you'll overfit everything. You'll overthink. Um, and I have friends in Portugal who have written about this and you know, certain psychopathologies can actually be a reflection of overthinking, overmentalizing, and uh, having too many hierarchical levels. And I think the best expression uh, with tongue in cheek of this pathology is a philosopher, <laughs> particularly a philosopher of consciousness. <laughs> so, so they, they spend their entire lives worrying about experience and quality of experience and uh, nature of consciousness uh, so they they're really overfitting their, their world uh, and having a lovely time indulging in their epistemic affordances uh, but there will probably be never an, no answer so i've always thought that, 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 that you know that, that, that this argument was uh, not only explains consciousness but also explains the existence of philosophers um or, or why or why there are so few of them or good ones anyway. Uh, so so from that point of view, I think there is a really uh, fundamental upper bound. I should say that that view, in my eyes, has been vindicated by recent moves in uh, in philosophy. This is not my field, so this is just hearsay from my friends in philosophy. So people like David Chalmers and Andy Clark have been in, in exchange um, on what has now become the new focus, which is the, the next hierarchical level up, um, which is the meta problem. So this is not the hard problem. This is the meta problem. The, the, why do we find the hard problem so puzzling? So this is this is so this is this is wonderfully metacognitive, and that's now the new question. And I think I think that this um, this this story that I just told you. Um, I think has something to say about the meta problem. You know, as Andy Clark summarizes it, you know, why is it that we are so puzzled by the um, by our qualitative experiences? Uh, you know, why, why do we spend our entire lives with an existential angst, with, you know, eluding any ontolo you know, ontological security just by being being philosophical about our own existence? Um, and it, you know, clearly from the point of view of our conversation, that you know, this is just an expression of responding to epistemic affordances in in a, you know, a highly uncultured um, 
context you know, of, of, of cultural niche construction, which is philosophy uh, and communication. Um, but from the point of view of um, you know the meta problem or the meta hard problem being answerable, I think I think that the, 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 there is a, a beautiful answer um, that is engendered or insight that's engendered just by asking that question, asking the meta the meta hard question or the meta question. Um, and that's the very fact that we are aware of our qualitative experiences is itself very revealing. And it speaks exactly to this high level that we were just talking about, um, which is a system making inferences, having hypotheses about its sense making. And the consequence is that in terms of overt and covert action, the plans you commit to either by cardiac acceleration or covert action by attending to this or attending to that uh, so, you know, so, source of evidence. So that tells you that you know, there are only certain creatures or systems that will ever be exposed or even uh, ask the kind of questions that um, form the meta problem or the meta hard problem. Um, uh, and it's only those kinds of uh, questions uh, sorry, it's only those kinds of systems that have this capacity to actually realise that they are something and that they are something that is doing inference or belief updating in different contexts. Uh, so just knowing that, I think, um, um, provides uh, you know, a nice solution to the meta problem, at least, if not the hard problem in and of itself. So I, I find this fascinating. I repeat, it's not my area of expertise. You have to get David Chalmers on to see what he thinks about it in a moment. Why do you think that is? Is it is it just a matter of historical contingency that there were these creatures that happened to have the right machinery, the right substrate that that got them that got them to that scale? Yeah, again, that's a great question. Um, I think there's a principled answer to that question. In effect, I've already given it. Remember that um, the only um, imperative for your generative model is that which maximizes uh, the likelihood, the marginal likelihood of all your sensations. So now you ask yourself, why on earth would I have a generative model um, that included a sense of self and indeed a sense of sense of self or self-awareness? Why? Um, and I think the answer is very simple. It's just that we have to um, um, generate predictions of a universe in which there are other creatures who are doing the same thing. So as soon as you have a sense of self and other, uh, then I have to have one to, to understand what you're doing, to make sense of you, all the sensations that you generate. And of course, as soon as you start talking, I'm now going to have to have uh, you know, uh, a self-awareness in order to do the turn-taking that's necessary for us to actually communicate. So I think it's just a reflection of something we are talking about before, that uh, self-evidencing, active inference, predictive processing of this inactive and situated sort has always to be seen in context. And if the context is, uh, I'm doing this in a universe that's populated by things like me, then there's going to be a natural tendency for increasing sophistication, depth of sophistication to disambiguate who's talking and to be able to talk in the first place. So I, what that says is that we wouldn't have these conversations and we wouldn't have these hierarchically deeply and delicately crafted generative models crafted by this evolutionary level of, um, of um, 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 model selection in the absence of our conspecifics and, uh, and our brothers and sisters. It just wouldn't be there. So it, you're only going to find this level of, uh, or this depth of self-organization and sentient behavior in populations, basically. Um, so that, you know, I, I think that, that is a simple consequence and a simple answer to your question, why me? Why why are we this, have these privileged, really high level uh, things that we may only share with things like dolphins? I don't know. Um, uh, 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 you know, I think it's just a reflection um, that we uh, co-evolved um, and, um, you know, um, and the nature of that co-evolution um, that itself is a free energy minimizing process means that there are lots of examples of me and that we're all we're all coupled through our through our action perception cycles what do you think of of extended cognition the idea that if cognition can be extended out uh, with artifacts in the world and that somehow increases the uh, 
the possibility space or the depth that can be imagined here. Yeah. Well, I, I like that notion very much, but that's because I like Andy Clark. So, it's, it's, uh, so you know, and it's uh, um, so the notion of extended cognition, I think, is um, um, which I'm taking here the kind of uh, um, take on the ability for, for me to store all my phone numbers on my smartphone is a way of basically extending my. my um, um, my, my my cognitive ability. Uh, the other example I love here is is the ability to of uh, very young Chinese children who have been trained on an abacus since age of two, and so they become so fluent and manually dexterous in, in a radically inactive sense that they can do comp computations so fluently by externalizing, acting in their world, physically acting on their world through their active states, that they can then internalize it and become wonderful um, arithmeticians uh, without the actual physical so they just rehearse so i think the that, that that extension sort of goes in two directions that yes you can um when you put action into the loop you suddenly now have a kind of um extension of self-organization that now has to accommodate the exchange of you with the body and extra personal space and all the artifacts that we have and that we can build, such as iPhones and, and um, uh, all other electronic devices that augment our cognitive capacities. Uh, but also, you know, completing the circle, a lot of that can be sort of you know, absorbed back into the brain. If we just imagine, you know, yeah, a good musician, for example, I can, I, I can, I can, I don't know because I can't do music, but um, I imagine a lot of the creativity is really a reflection of rehearsing, um, phys either articulated in song or um, uh, physically articulated in, ter in terms of playing an instrument. What would happen if I did that in my head? And then being able to create just by imagining creative, uh, creative acts. So in a sense, this is extended, but it's extended, but you know, it's come back inside into our simulation machinery as part of this generative model that is necessary for planning. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are these examples of, I'm sure you're aware of, of machines that are just using cybernetic principles and they don't have any, any like they don't have a motor to them or they don't have a circuit to them or anything like that. And they seem self-organizing. They seem, um, and then one imagines how far that could be taken. Uh, could you have a cognitive system on a totally different substrate that, that we don't even know of? Yeah, I'm sure we can. I, th I think, we're, as, as you point out, we're, we're seeing this kind of thing emerge um, in silico, in um, machine learning of, the, of a particular kind that commits to. So uh, I, I have a friend, Matt Brown, who, who, who loves and spent years trying to understand you know, the original documents and the uh, derivations of Ross Ashby. And has spent years implementing this in, in you know in silico and has got some amazing results um and you also see it uh, you know i have another friend uh, john tani in japan who has uh so that he comes in the field of neuro robotics and, and you could actually argue developmental neuro robotics but you know simply by um having a bank of uh, having a dynamical system encoded in a computer that plays the role of a very deep generative model um, and then just exposing um, a simulated or robot child to various things, he can engender really interesting behaviors, actually choosing to, you know, throwing ball, pushing balls between or choosing one ball versus another ball. Very, very impressive um, sort of emergent behavior just by having a self-organizing predictive, predictive processing machine under the hood that can actually move. Um, you also see it, interestingly, um, emerging now in um in several guises um in um the, the ultimate in biomimetic uh, computing which by which i mean in cell cultures so now you're starting to see um behaviors that are entirely compliant with this kind of um self-evidencing emerge spontaneously in cell cultures in vitro, literally in glass or on, on, on a glass dish. Uh, um, uh, and I would imagine next year in um, little organoids and in brainoids that have been discovered in the right way. So these behaviors are now being recorded and observed and characterized in terms of self-evidencing or uh, predictive processing or active inference formally. Um, and they're now appearing in the, in the, in, in the literature. 
So I see that, that is a very nice example of what you just described, that you know, just, just get the right kind of system that seems to self-organize in a way that it endures in a particular state for long enough. And it will show some kind of intelligent behavior, I think, absolutely. Okay, uh, final question. Uh, so you, you seem to be really good at managing both really complicated conceptual work and also applying it and, and paying attention to the empirical development. Um, are the, do you have any, any general principles or ideas to share about how to manage that, how to manage conceptual and empirical work? That's a good question, which I don't have a preformed answer to. Um, I mean, in a sense, the um, the application or the, the job or the process of scientific inquiry and you know the way that I would describe my life and I would I suspect to essentially your life as well in terms of your quintessentially curious and you know, you're you're a kind of scientist uh, soliciting the right kind of evidence to resolve uncertainty about this belief or this hypothesis versus that. I think for both of us. Um, um, the whole process of scientific inquiry that rests upon having the right kinds of ideas and hypotheses and then securing evidence for those by um, committing to an empirical experiment just as a statement of this action perception cycle we've been talking about. So I don't really see it can be any other way. Um, you can certainly get different kinds of scientists who just like uh, the, the, uh, the discovery part of it. Uh, and don't have very deep hypotheses, or you can get pure theoreticians who rely upon their friends to do all the hard, active part and do the experiments. But collectively, uh, the, you know, I, you know I, very much like the the data and the model dialectic you were talking about before, I think that these are two sides of the same coin, and they both have to go into this fundamental imperative, which is this surprise or um, or sort of free energy bound on the surprisal in order to um, to self-organize and to self-evidence. So I don't have any advice other than um, other than uh, practically uh, make sure that you give yourself the opportunity to indulge in curious behavior. And that curiosity may be entirely covert. And it may be just thinking a lot in the morning. I normally do that with my pipe, at least for two hours. Um, but also, uh, it, you know, it, it has to be overt as well. You actually have to go out there and get evidence from this hypothesis and that hypothesis, even if it's just sort of type uh, your numerical analyses to test whether this your internal conception of this dynamic or this functional form mathematically was correct. Uh, but m making that opportunity, if you're a young scientist, um, really depends upon the right career choices. So keep your options open and just create space to be curious.